Um, I'm Dr. Kurt Devine. Most of you know me. Dr. Bell, I believe, has not shown up yet. She is on her way back from Arizona and unfortunately got on a different flight. And so she uh, couldn't make it like planned. So we'll, uh, so we'll go without her. Uh, so a few announcements. Remember, these are recorded. And if you don't want to be recorded with your video, I, I get that. But otherwise, again, love to have you turn it on. There is free CME. And just make sure that you fill out the little thing afterwards and you get the little CME for this. That's one credit. Um, and if there's more than one person that's in your room, please uh, tell us the names of who's in your room so that they can also get the free CME. Make sure you rename yourself. Everybody's pretty good at that in the, in the days of COVID now. And uh, uh, remember, uh, case presentations are always fun. I think we have one today uh, that we're going to talk about that's actually pretty interesting. Uh, Heather and I went through that this morning. It's uh, a great case. So uh, that should be a lot of fun. Um, we have some up, upcoming ones. Next uh, next week is actually addiction, or two weeks from now, I'm sorry, addiction screening and treatment basics. And, uh, and as you can see, lots of, uh, lots of other great talks coming. Uh, remember our Wednesday Echo Tomorrow has been canceled. We have uh, some excitement going on in our little group. And uh, so we canceled it because of some other things. We'll tell you about that later. We may have pictures. But uh, we had some, we did have a reason we had to uh, stop that. But on the 26th and the 2nd, uh, Cole, Cole's coming back, Dr. Cole. He's both toxicology boarded and now an addiction fellow. And he's going to be doing a great talk on the uh, antidepressants, the negative consequences. Uh, should be a great talk. So please do, feel free to come for that. This week, we actually have testing options uh, from the from Mayo Clinic. Uh, we have one of our physicians from the Mayo Clinic talking about the different home tests, how good they are, the limitations should also be a great one. Uh, we just released uh, another methadone talk with Dr. Charlie Resnikoff uh, today. It's a really a fun talk, just the nitty gritty of uh, methadone and methadone clinics. So if you wanna learn a little bit more about that, so you know what your patients who are coming to you who wanna be switched from methadone, what goes on at the methadone clinics should be fun. Remember, we're always here. If you have questions, we get lots of calls. I had a nice call this morning from Wadena about a patient, we're always happy to help you. Uh, and again, uh, call us anytime. We have our phone numbers. So today, this is actually kind of a fun talk. I, uh, I've been working on this one for a while um, and never quite got it done till now, but it was uh, something I've been working on for a while. Uh, basically, it's gonna, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the shared neurobiology of addiction and chronic pain, how basically they're kind of the same thing. And Christy, I just want to make sure, is my audio really good? Yes, very good. Okay, perfect, because I can't put on a headphone if I need to. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about the basic neurology that's shared by them. And it's really a pretty interesting thing that parts of our brains uh, do both of it uh, so, uh, or, or are involved in both of these issues. And so we're going to recognize some of the comorbidities often present in both and kind of identify some of those clinical characteristics, which are similar in both addiction and chronic pain. So uh, interesting little talk. So chronic pain and opioid use. Uh, how do they overlap? And really, it's, it's kind of one of those things is, you know, which came first? It's that whole chicken and the egg, or does one always come first, or, or can it be both ways? Uh, and I think that that's really an interesting thing. I think all of us uh, believe that typically opioid use disorder is always the first thing that shows up, uh, sometimes in the heroin crowd and the, and the fentanyl crowd. But then again, we have all the patients that we see who have been on chronic pain meds for a long time, who clearly had chronic pain and then developed opioid use disorder. So there's lots of different ways to look at this. Uh, and so which came first? So they, you know, if we look at the, the literature, there's a lot of chronic pain that predates opioid use and opioid use disorder. And chronic pain can also develop after the onset of opioid use and OUD. So one of the examples of this would actually be when we see patients who have chronic pain, often we'll see them get worse pain or different types of pain while they're on their, while they're on their opioids. And, and this is one of the things that causes that is opioid hyperalgesia, which is something that's been described uh, really for a, a long time. I mean, literally for the last 80, 90 years, people have understood that sometimes people take opioids and actually have worsened pain uh, as well. It's interesting that, that even though they knew this 100 years ago, uh, if you go to most clinics and you talk to primary care doctors, most of those doctors are not aware of opioid hyperalgesia. And that's something that 
uh, in different places that we've spoken over the years. We talk about it a lot, uh, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more today. So opioid use disorder and chronic pain are both commonly com complicated by, obviously, mental health diagnosis. And Dr. Bell gave uh, really a wonderful talk last week about some of these issues. And really, if you look at some of the most common, it'd really be depression uh, and often anxiety, bipolar disorder, and obviously uh, schizophrenia, which is something that, uh, especially when we were working some in the, uh, uh, in the correctional care realm, uh, you see a lot of the schizophrenia and, uh, and use disorders overlapping and ending up in incarceration. So really, uh, both of these are complicated by mental health. And I think that's one of the ways uh, that, that they intersect. There's really an interesting study, and I don't know how to say this guy's name. I'm just going to say her. Uh, this was a study that was done by uh, this Dr. Her and a, and a lot of other people. And they re did really an interesting thing is they took the uh, medical records. They did this all using the EMR, looking at chronic pain among, among patients with opioid use disorder. And, and it was really they used a ton of patients. It was like 50,000 patients in this EMR. And what they did is they broke these patients up into four different groups to try and kind of figure out the whole, what came first. And they broke them up into people with no chronic pain who had opioid use disorder. They had people who had opioid use disorder prior to their pain and also opioid use disorder and pain kind of at the same time. The patient really couldn't say which of them came first, felt like that, that it all kind of came on at one time. And then of course you got the chronic pain patients that. Uh, they got the pain prior to the opioid use disorder. So they wanted to look at these four different groups and just see uh, really what the characteristics of these were and, and give us a little bit better idea of how to better break them up. Um, and, it, and it was actually four mil, over 4 million patients. But the funny thing is, if you look at how many patients actually had an opioid use disorder, there's only about 5,000. And I I think it's that's interesting because you, you really look at opioid use disorder probably hitting about one and a half to two percent of the population, and this would be a really small number, I think, uh, in this study cohort uh, that had diagnosed opioid use disorder. So I'm not sure how the identification of that went, but the reality is they had these 5,300 people that that they really looked at. One of the problems with this study, and even when I was reading this, and you looked about where they got these patients, most of these patients were actually uh, male, white, and had private insurance. This was not a study that was done to kind of give us a good cross-section of, of a normal population, but it was done in, in a place where typically people had, uh, had the insurance and, and other things. And what they found when they, in this study as they looked at these four groups is that about 65% of the patients with opioid use disorder actually had chronic pain conditions. So, so more than half. And when they looked at, at, at this other group, that 61% of this particular group actually had pain prior to their opioid use disorder diagnosis. And so it really right around that 60% when it went either way. So you got 64% of the patients who had OUD and then, and then that group, 60% had pain prior to their opioid use disorder. Uh, and again, not an uncommon thing following the, you know, the prescribing of the opioids over the last decade to 15 years uh, that we would see this. And statistically, when we look back, Five years ago, I could easily say that four out of five people who developed an opioid use disorder had started on prescriptions they got from doctors, and many of those were for people with chronic pain, uh, but often uh, also acute pain that just those medications never got stopped. So some of the other results that they got were interesting in that patients with opioid use disorders prior to developing pain we're more likely to have another substance use disorder. So basically what they found is that patients who developed an opioid use disorder and then develop pain, and again, uh, often they would develop pain because of things like opioid hyperalgesia uh, caused by the opioid. And we'll, again, we'll talk about that in a moment, but they were also likely to have another SU, SUD. And again, common things are common. And the things that we often think about would be things like alcohol, uh, uh, tobacco could certainly be considered in there, but cocaine, methamphetamine and other things. Patients who, uh, with an opioid use disorder first, uh, as you might expect, also had the highest risks of the infectious complications because if these patients were using IV, often they would be getting HIV and hepatitis and, and other things that could be passed on. So this is kind of an interesting group in that, that when they developed the opioid use disorder first, 
Again, these are people that may have some predisposition genetically to opioid use disorders and, uh, and have had one previously uh, prior to starting on uh, opioids. Now, when they looked at the patients who develop chronic pain first, and if we think about the patients that we see in our clinics who develop chronic pain in their 30s and 40s, which uh, you know, I've, I've clearly seen in my career, these patients very often or, or had significant higher rates of mental health disorders, heart disease, respiratory disease, sleep disorders, cancer, and diabetes. So in general, this is a group that is not healthy. And there's a lot of reasons that people think that this is, this is the case, that often these are people who had many medical troubles from the beginning. Uh, they may smoke a lot, they may drink a lot, they have uh, poor genetics, and they end up developing a lot of different uh, issues that then lead to them being on opioid use, you know, being using opioids from the physician. So much higher rates in, in patients with chronic pain of those of all of these things, not just the mental health disorders. And if you look at uh, back at that group with the opioid use disorder prior to their chronic pain, again, we, we just mentioned a little bit how this is a group that often uh, has another substance use disorder, but the highest prevalence is really alcohol. And I think often we forget about alcohol when we talk about heroin and we talk about methamphetamine. Uh, still far and away, alcohol is legal. People can go and buy it. Uh, and so it's very, very common that people will develop that and then get put on um, opioids. And I can tell you, I, I'm thinking of one of my patients right now who was uh, having issues with alcohol from the time he was 20 uh, and then developed chronic pain and was started on opioids. Um, and, you know, and this is just a common, common thing. Uh, this group has the highest incidence of alcohol or drug-induced disorders. And again, that whole list of all the different things that can occur when people are using alcohol uh, and mixing it with opioids as well. So a uh, very common issue with people who develop opioid use disorder that they had a previous substance use disorder. When we look at when pain developed prior to or at the same time as an opioid use disorder, uh, these patients, again, interestingly, had much higher use of different things like sedatives, hypnotics, uh, sleepers. Uh, you know, the benzos, all of those different things. And they actually had the lowest rate of alcohol, marijuana, and amphetamine, and cocaine, and uh, hallucinogenic use. So it's interesting that the patients who developed pain first, uh, prior to the OUD, were already using lots of other different medications, uh, probably prescribed, and some uh, sub substances not prescribed. Uh, it's not uncommon for us to see somebody who is buying benzos on the street, uh, and sleepers on the street who have had chronic pain um, and developed op opioid use disorder. Uh, these things are easily uh, bought and, and we see that a lot. So um, again, a little bit of overlap here. If you look at the results of the study, 70% of this entire sample. So if we take this whole group, 70% of them had comorbid mental health disorders. So as a group, this is a you know, whether, whether it came first or second, this is still a group that has an enormous amount of mental health disorders. Uh, they really have the lowest prevalence uh, in, in the patients with opioid use disorder alone. Uh, and I can tell you that, that early on, four and five and six years ago, it was not uncommon for, for me to see somebody with an opioid use disorder who was using heroin. And one of the, one of the hoops that you had to jump through to get uh, Suboxone was you had to go through a mental health eval. Uh, and it didn't matter whether you had, had a mental health issue or not. That was part of the, what the state made you do if you were on state insurance. And it was very common that these patients did not have a mental health disorder. And I, I had numerous ones of them who did not want to go through the, and, and go through a whole hour with a therapist of, because they didn't feel like they had a, any type of mental health issue. So uh, that is the group that has only the opioid use disorder and nothing else uh, that will uh, often uh, pop in. So just to, just to touch a little bit on the opioid hyperalgesia, you know, just as an aside here, um, when we look at patients who've been on opioids for prolonged periods of time, they will develop opioid hyperalgesia, which is basically a state of kind of this enhanced pain sensitization. Uh, and, and I can tell you that often you don't diagnose this until their opioids are discontinued or tapered. And so it's one of those diagnoses often you don't make until you've done something. Uh, and we have a lot of conversations with patients about being on long-term opioids. 
and feeling like that their pain is worse than it was. And there are some tricks to kind of understanding whether or not uh, that, is the, that is the issue. And again, this is something that was first described in 1870. So we're talking 100, 150 years ago uh, when Dr. Albert said, at times I have certainly felt it's a, it a great responsibility to say that pain, which I know is an evil, is less injur injurious than morphine, which also may be an evil. Does morphine encourage the very pain that it pretends to relieve? And, and I can tell you it is frequent that that occurs. And it was noticed even back then that some of the patients that they had on morphine seemed to have more pain than they did prior to starting it. So, so just keep that in mind that I think that one of the things that we've got um, you know, to think about is when we see these people and they're having pain that's, that's different, we have to think about it. One of the things you think about with opioid hyperalgesia is that um, the pain can come on, it can be different. Sometimes people will have pain that seems to be the same as it was before they started opioids. It's just markedly worse as you go up on their doses. Um, I would say more often, I will see patients who will have developed multiple other types of pain. So they will have more generalized pain. And again, they'll have almost this diffuse uh, allodynia where in fact, things that normally would not seem like they would hurt or be uncomfortable to them uh, is unbearable. And, and they're sensitized. And so that pain um, seems to come on with just about anything that they do. And, and often, again, the higher we go on the dose, the worse their pain seems to get. So, so again, think about opioid hyperalgesia as we look at these patients, because <clears throat> often it can just be just very different. It can be vague pain. It can be it can be just generalized pain uh, that they didn't have prior to this. So let's talk about, this should say chronic pain, common brain mechanisms of chronic pain and addiction. This was actually in Neuron 2015. And we're gonna talk a little bit about, about this paper that uh, was in Neuron, just because it's really interesting how they looked at the common mechanisms. Cause I think that that's the thing that we wanna think about is how are these actually the same or how, how come there's so much in common with chronic pain patients and patients with addiction? And what is the mechanism? And chronic pain by some is kind of considered to be a CNS, CNS disease. It, you know, that whole saying, well, it's in your head. Uh, well, it's not really in your head. It can be in your brain and your spinal cord and the way your body manages the sensations that it gets and how over time this can change. If you look at both pain and addiction disorders, they're actually characterized very, by very similar things. Um, and actually that should say fun there, the end kind of, I don't know how that dropped out of there. Um, but these patients will have difficulty having any pleasure. Uh, they tend to be compulsive uh, and drug seeking. They tend to be very stressed out and very anxious. And both pain and addiction have these similar issues. And, and let's look at them a little bit, a little bit more. What really drives that? What really drives the these issues where people end up with both addiction and chronic pain. And one of the things is really reward deficiency. And reward deficiency is, is kind of an interesting thing. Um, reward deficiency um, is really kind of this neuro, neuro adaptation of pain, right? So they, uh, if you get this continued activation of the reward circuits, what happens is over time, there's a depletion of the things that normally would give you pleasure. And that would be dopamine. So as we continue to get this activation uh, to this pain, suddenly we start running out of dopamine. And then we, you know, I hate to say we go into a funk, but things just, things then don't seem the same. And so what this leads to is that, that de decreased pleasure, that decreased motivation, often things that, it, you know, we see in patients who are using heroin or fentanyl or, or IV opioids. But if you think about the patients that you have with chronic pain, one of the things I think about all the time is how when I would inherit some of these patients, they weren't doing anything. They stayed in their house. They, they, there was nothing about their life that was fun. They had no pleasure, no social outlets. They're using opiates all day, and they're just making sure that they get their pills on time. And, and so they've, they've basically, over time with their pain and some other things that we'll talk about, have just basically depleted their dopamines, and they, and they just sit. Um, and they watch TV and that is their day. Um, if you look at the flip side of that, like at the bottom of the list is anti-reward, okay? And so the anti-reward is kind of another neuroadaptation that we get. 
And this is caused a little differently. It's caused by that over recruitment of, in your limbic system. So if you look at your amygdala and your hippocampus and your habanula, um, these things, when they are over recruited, they release things that cause another problem. So they re release what we would call stressogenic neurochemicals, things like norepinephrine, uh, corticotropin releasing hormone, substance P, which of course we know is, uh, has been involved in, in pain. And so when you release all these, what happens is you tend to get more anxiety and fear and depression. And, and one would think probably then the way you perceive your pain is much worse. And so it's just a, it's basically overstimulating that you release all these other different hormones. And then the next thing, you know, uh, you, much of your day is overrun by anxiety and depression and, and just basically, uh, catastrophizing your pain. And so both reward deficiency and anti-reward, uh, work towards sending you down a spiral, which is difficult to come out of. Um, when we talk about impaired inhibitory control, that's really your frontal lobe. And, you know, Dr. Bell's got this thing. She always calls it your adulting. Uh, and, and I don't know so much that it's your adulting. It's just your ability to make reasonable choices, right? I guess that would be adulting. Um, and so if you lose that ability to, to make these good decisions and to have your, and to lack that motivation, a lot of things are going to happen that aren't going to be good, right? So in addiction, the motivation to obtain drugs, of course, is, disproportionately higher than the actual value of that substance. And what, what, what I mean by that is often people want it more than they like it. And if you talk to patients, what happens is they spend an enormous amount of their time trying to get their substance, right? They're driving clear to the Twin Cities. They're working extra hours to get the cash. They're doing all this stuff. And they horribly crave and want this substance. But when they get it, when they're in the throes of addiction and it's been going on a long time, it doesn't really make them feel that much better. It keeps them from getting sick, but it does not cause them pleasure, so to speak. It's, it's basically keeping away uh, the things that are, uh, that are making them feel terribly. And if you think about chronic pain in kind of that same way, all the attention is really on the medications they take and, and patients are really fixated on how many pills they get a month and how many they take a day and all their fixation is on that. And they downplay the positive effects of anything other than that therapy option. So they don't wanna talk about physical therapy. Um, not, nothing else works. The only thing that helps my pain is the, is the pain medicine. They don't wanna exercise. They don't wanna to go to therapy. Um, and so that's really difficult. And it's not really until if you've had patients that have been tapered off their medications, it's not until they stop that people realize oh my God, I, I really feel great. I can't believe how bad I felt before. And, and they don't understand when they're in the middle of it, how poor they actually feel. And so I think uh, that that's, it's an interesting thing how the focus for a chronic pain person is often the pills and, and they will hear nothing else about the other things that might be helpful to their particular situation. Um, when we look at, um, you know, when we look at, uh, uh, some of the other things like the aberrant learning, which is on there. I think this is something that, that clearly, obviously, we all understand with addiction, that uh, it's that complete kind of disregard uh, for anything that's, um, that's not their drug, right? So uh, they're basically not concerned about anything that's going to happen to them, the negative consequences. And I think that if we look at with pain, pain medications and, and all these things, they become less and less rewarding and less and less effective as time goes on. Um, but at the same time, they interfere with everybody's daily functions. Uh, they interfere with their social lives. They interfere with everything. But patients don't recognize that. They minimize that. Uh, and, and they've learned that when they get the medication or they get their substance that they're, they might be misusing, uh, that is the only thing that matters. And again, it's that wanting it more than, than liking it. So, so all of these things work together to kind of help drive you know, all of these things in chronic pain uh, and, and make this kind of the end, uh, make this kind of the end where, where we end up in this, in this situation where nothing is working well, our social, we are isolated socially, we're not, we don't do anything that gives us pleasure or fun, and we're, at a, we're really in a state of high stress. Um, and how big a deal is this? I mean, it, you know, chronic pain, I think we all understand is a, is a huge problem. There's 120 million Americans who are affected by chronic pain. And if you look, at the economic impact, we're talking 
you know, in lost productivity and medical expenses, and disability, probably $600 billion a year uh, that goes out the door uh, for chronic pain. And so this is not a small, small issue. And I think that what we have to understand is that this number is increasing substantially, despite the fact that the analgesics, including the opioids, obviously are very ineffective, uh, you know, most of the time. And again, one of the studies that's often that's often brought up in situations like this is the SPACE study from just a few years ago that basically showed in placebo controlled trials, you know, that ibuprofen and opioids are probably uh, equally effective for chronic pain. And so, you know, here we are, uh, we still have an enormous number of patients with, uh, with opioids. I think whenever we're talking about chronic pain and we're talking about um, addiction, we always need to understand a couple simple things as well that you need to kind of keep in your back pocket about how, how these things uh, have such similar uh, descriptions. And reward is something that, that clearly we see in addiction where people use, and that is the reward. It's a kind of a pleasurable and motivating process, right? And, and we see that as well when we look at uh, chronic pain because of when they get their pills, it's almost exhilarating. It's exhilarating uh, to get that pain to go away with, you will, even though most often the pain doesn't go away, but it's, the, it's that feeling of, of uh, pleasure when we can actually uh, take our medications, which can be contrasted with, with the word pleasure, okay? Pleasure is different. Uh, it, it kind of represents kind of a, kind of a variety of uh, affective states, you know, uh, supporting kind of the satisfaction of immediate needs. So when we talk about pleasure, really it's about supporting the satisfaction of immediate needs like food, water, and sex, right? And social behaviors, attachment, things like that. Um, so those are things that typically give us pleasure, which is different from euphoria. Euphoria is completely different in that it's more of this affective state of well-being and self-confidence and sociability that we get. And, and if you've seen somebody who's recently used heroin or fentanyl, you will see somebody who is clearly euphoric. Uh, they're very confident. They're very chatty um, if, until they fall asleep. But they often, it's just a different thing. And we see this as well early on when people use alcohol, this uh, feeling of being social, this feeling of confidence and uh, being able to uh, work with the situation. Even in, patient, even in people's lives when they don't know people, alcohol often is what they use to increase that. So can we use addiction neurobiology to understand chronic pain? Uh, you, might, you might surmise that probably if I'm even talking about it, that, that yeah, we probably can uh, because there, there's such overlap in what's going on in the brain. Uh, I think it's important to understand that there aren't any clinical studies that directly link chronic pain and addiction. But there's a, really a big body of evidence that suggests a couple simple ideas of how they are related. Um, number one, there are substantial overlaps between the brain regions that are engaged by both pain um, and its onset, offset, and the addictive drugs and analgesic drugs, right? The same parts of the brain are affected in both of these two issues or, and are involved in how things progress with time. Uh, and they've done this through many studies, as you can imagine, when they're using different types of brain scanning and uh, uh, spectrographs and different things that show us what part of the brain's uh, being involved in these situations. And number two, I think that it's important to understand that there's a predisposition for addictive behavior. Uh, and that's ingrained in pain neuropathology uh, because of some of these neural changes that are comparable, very comparable to long-term substance abuse. And you can see this in patients who really never had a history of prior substance abuse. They will still have this predisposition. And so there, there's significant overlap in, in these two areas. Um, and the bottom line is it's really that relationship between chronic pain and addiction that, that, that can probably be explained by partly shared neural systems. It's all these different parts of the brain, the amygdala, and all these parts of the brain that, that help, with, help us end up in a situation where chronic pain either uh, continues or worsens. And we see as well with addiction to certain parts of the brain that are basically hijacked. Um, and both chronic pain and addiction are associated with dopaminergic surges, right? That's what gives us our rewards. And when we look at what happens to people's dopamine in chronic pain when they get their medications or when in chronic, or in chronic uh, substance use where uh, patients get that reward motivation, the same learning centers are being used in both of these situations and how they manage and how they move through their disease, if you will, 
uh, is very similar because of dopamine. Dopamine is kind of that link that basically ties these things together. So as a wrap up, we're gonna, we're gonna do this. And it's, it's kind of interesting because if we look at the DSM-5, some of the DSM-5 criteria of how, uh, how we diagnose a, su a substance use disorder, in this case, an opioid use disorder, and some of the things that also play a part in chronic pain, they're very similar, okay? And, and so I'm gonna show you some of these just because it's pretty interesting. If you look at the criteria for a substance use disorder, tolerance is always one of those things that's right at the top of the list. And if you look at chronic pain and you look at pain tolerance, we can see that people in general can become tolerant as well to pain. And we've seen this many times in athletes, victims of torture. Uh, it's, it's very interesting if you think about it, that the effect of pain discontinuation, and I'll give you a, a 1980s example of that. When I was running in college, people would say, I don't know how you would want it. Why would you want to run so far? And, and the stock answer of any long distance runner at the time was, it feels so good when I stop. Okay. And what is that? That's, it, it's the pain discontinuation. You tolerate an enormous amount of pain and it feels great when you stop. And uh, it, I, when I read this, I, I thought of that right away um, because that was just what we always said is, oh, it feels great when I stop. It's kind of that, you know, hitting your head with a hammer feels good when I stop. Uh, so again, pain tolerance, uh, very similar to the tolerance that we develop with uh, substance use disorders. One of the other criteria is giving up or reducing important social, occupational, recreational activities. This is a hallmark of chronic pain. And in fact, when, when I think about the patients, and I had about 15 patients with chronic pain before I moved to my new situation, um, you know, this was when I got these patients, they weren't doing anything. They were sitting at home, they were watching TV, they considered themselves disabled. And that's a hallmark of chronic pain is they don't do anything. They've severed a lot of ties. Uh, it's just become uh, a life of just sitting in their home, letting everybody take care of them. And so uh, again, very, very similar. Uh, cravings or strong desire or urge to use a substance. Well, if you look at people with chronic pain, pain motivates people to seek pain relief. Okay, and is that craving or is that an urge? But it is the motivation for these patients to continue to do the cycle that they have done for months, years, decades sometimes. Um, taking a, a substance in larger amount and for a longer period of time than intended. Well, I think that, that have you, if you've taken care of people with chronic pain, it is that compulsive seeking of your opioids um, is driven by the desire to get rid of their pain that is not true you know, is inadequately treated. And I, and I think that that's the key is that I would never say these patients don't have pain because they do. And often we're the person giving them the pain with the medications that we're using, but they consider their pain inadequately treated. And so given the opportunity to take more, patients will take more. Uh, very similar to patients with, uh, you know, the criteria for a substance use disorder. How about withdrawal symptoms? It's very interesting that you know, if somebody has built up a tolerance and, and they are withdrawing from heroin or from uh, fentanyl, yeah, they get pretty sick. If you look at patients, they will often develop increased stress when they have chronic pain, kind of this arousal or anxiety. And it, and it a lot of times plays a key role in their pain exacerbation. Often it's, it's, they're not in withdrawal, but they're, they catastrophize their pain to the point where they develop these symptoms. I know that uh, one of the speakers we've had on our echo a lot, uh, Dr. Murray McAllister, who's a pain psychologist, talks about a lot about pain catastrophizing and how, how when they get into this situation, it is very difficult for them to understand their pain because their pain basically rules every part of their life. So um, they can develop similar symptoms. Taking a substance to relieve withdrawal uh, is very similar, in fact, to people self-inflicting pain to improve their negative affective states. Um, one of the things that, and I've seen this, where patients will self-inflict pain, and in fact, inflicting worse pain that they have often re releases dopamine, and patients will then actually feel better. And so, although it's a very uh, difficult cycle to end up in, uh, this is clearly something I've seen where patients will actually inflict more pain to, to, receive, to receive that dopamine surge uh, and almost pleasure from the discomfort. Uh, I think often we find people in their, 
doing self injurious things. And I think we, we forget that a lot of times when they do that, they actually get a dopamine surge and feel better, uh, at least affected. Uh, I think this is the last one uh, they continue to use despite the knowledge of adverse consequences. Uh, the clinical characteristic of pain is that pain relief is, can be exhilarating. And, and, they, and the consequences to them uh, are less important. It's about, it's about the exhilaration of uh, pain relief or perceived pain relief. So if pain and addiction kind of share a common, um, whoops, I think I, whoop. so if pain and addiction share a common neurobiological function, there could be significant implications in the treatment and monitoring. I think that's the thing that we have to, uh, that we really have to think about is that, you know, how is this going to help us to know these things? And I think that's what's important. And I think we got to look at this for two different ways. Number one, the exposure to addictive substances can predispose a patient to development of chronic pain, whereas the development of chronic painful condition can, may increase the risk of substance use disorder. So if we look at the first one, you know, if we've got somebody who's been exposed to addictive substances and, and understand that this can predispose a patient to development of chronic pain, what, where, do we, where do we step in or what do we do? And I would tell you that most often this is about education for this group. If, if patients have been exposed to these substances, maybe they had a uh, maybe they had an injury or a fracture and they ended up on pain meds. And now we're in this situation where it's a concern that, that we're going to be able to get them off. It's really having that talk with the patient about what, what can happen on this slippery slope. They need to understand the expectations of these medications. Uh, and we need to educate them, really educate them on the kind of the long-term effects that they could have if they stayed on these medications and where we could head. I talk to patients about opioid, helper, opioid hyperalgesia all the time. Uh, and even when they've been on medications for a week or two, it's important that they understand if they don't think their pain is getting better, that can already be a sign of opioid hyperalgesia. Um, and again, one of the other things we need to think about in this particular thing, if somebody is using an opioid, for instance, that's being prescribed and we're concerned that it's going to end up being chronic, is do they have another substance use disorder? And that's something we have to, we have to always uh, approach. In the second case, the development of chronic pain will condition may increase the risk of a substance use disorder. I think this is why we screen for substance use disorders, right? This is the patient, if they have a chronic painful condition, before we even consider doing something that might include opioids, even intermittently, we need to be screening these patients for other, uh, other substance use disorders, considering alternate treatments. Um, we need to look at their family history. If they've got a whole family history of people with alcohol use disorder, uh, opioid use disorder. This is a patient that we want to really find a different way. And so uh, I, I can tell you often, if I get somebody that clearly has uh, a major health issue and painful issue, I'm trying to do something, even intermittent opioids and other therapies to avoid chronic, uh, because uh, again, the risk of a substance use disorder down the road is high. And so we always have to think about those things. So understand that that it can happen either way. And I think it's, it's our job to make sure whichever way you think things might go off the rails, we need to have that, those conversations with patients uh, right from the get-go. So lots of uh, good uh, things that were written about this. And I put a couple of the ones that I used on here. You can look those up if you'd like. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you know, I think that's uh, it. We're going to do a couple of poll questions too. Uh, this is something that they're trying to get a... Uh, um, Get a grip on. So I'm gonna, I don't know if I can put those polls up. Uh oh. You can, but I can do it too. Yeah. Well, let me unshare and make sure there's no questions. And uh, remember that you can get hold of us on Gmail. And we gave our phone numbers earlier, and I will stop sharing. And, uh, and if there's any questions, I am certainly not a neurobiologist by any stretch. I find this stuff really interesting, but. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if people have uh, thoughts or if you have experiences with some of these things, that's fine as well.